Welcome to Skyscope. This is our brand new show every Monday right here on this YouTube channel. That's right. We're here to bring you observational tips that, you know, go beyond just the usual suspects up there. Mm -hmm. For this calendar week 26, we are setting our sights on something truly mesmerizing, but uh, definitely challenging. It is that. It's the Crescent Nebula, officially known as NGC 6888. And NGC 6888, yeah. And our goal today, basically to arm you with everything you need to know to actually go out and, well, see it, uncover its beauty. This is Skyscope, challenging targets, real observing. So let's formally introduce our target again, NGC 6888. It's this, uh, Beautiful soft glow you can find up in Cygnus, the swan, you mm. know, in the summer skies. Familiar constellation for many. Definitely. It's got this incredible visual appeal, but, well, from my experience anyway, it does not give up its secrets easily. No, it doesn't. What makes it such a challenge, like cosmically speaking? Uh, well, putting it in context, yeah. this isn't just some random fuzzy patch, right? Right. The Crescent Nebula, it's this huge shell of glowing gas, stretches about 25 light years across. Wow, 25. Yeah, it's big. And it's about 5,000 light years away from us. Okay, so quite distant. It's the result of this powerful clash, essentially, between two different things the central star has produced. Okay. First, there's this super fast stellar wind. It's blasting outwards from the star in the middle. That's a wolf rayet star. A wolf rayet. What is that exactly? They're rare, extremely hot, really massive stars, and they're rapidly shedding their outer layers, just blowing material off at incredible speeds. Okay, so fast wind. What's the second part? The second part is the slower, denser gas that same star threw off much earlier in its life, back when it was a red giant. Oh, right, when it puffed up. Exactly. Yeah. A red giant is, you know, an older star, swollen up, cooled down, expanded, and it gently pushes off its outer atmosphere. So fast wind hitting slow gas. Precisely. This collision between the fast wind and that slower material ejected earlier, it compresses the gas, heats it up, makes it glow. Ah, creating the nebula shape. Creates that beautiful arc-shaped emission nebula. That's what yeah. gives the, the crescent its name. It's not static. It's happening right now. So we're seeing like ongoing cosmic action. You really are. Observing it is like watching a little piece of stellar evolution unfold. Witnessing cosmic evolution. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So if we want to catch this stellar drama, when's the absolute best time to actually try and look for NGC 6888? Good question. Timing is key. Yeah, especially for these fainter things. Absolutely crucial. If you're planning your observing nights, late June is really your sweet spot. Late June, okay. That's when the crescent culminates, reaches its highest point in the sky right around midnight. Highest point is good, less yeah. atmosphere. Exactly. For folks in, say, Central Europe, it can get up to about 60 degrees altitude. So clearer views, steadier seeing, hopefully. Significantly clearer, yeah. Less atmosphere equals sharper image. Plus, it's in Cygnus, right? Right. So the whole constellation stays well-placed pretty much all night long if you're at a good dark site. That midsummer window lets your eyes get fully dark adapted, lets you really hunt down and, you know, appreciate tougher objects like this one. Is it actually that hard to locate? Or is it a proper hunt? It's surprisingly straightforward, actually, assuming you're comfy with Cygnus. Okay, good. Think of it more like a guided treasure hunt, not just wandering aimlessly. All right, guide us then. Where do we start? You'll want to start at Deneb. From Deneb, just pan your scope about two telescopic fields, you know, the view through your eyepiece northeast, towards another bright star, Sadr. Center of the cross, roughly. Right near there, yeah. The Crescent Nebula then lies just kind of down and to the right of Sadr, lower right. Down and right from Sadr. That's a great visual way to put it. And for those who like precision, maybe using a go-to mount or setting circles, the coordinates for NGC 6888 are Rate ascension, 20 hours, 12 minutes, and declination, plus 38 degrees, 21 minutes. Rate right. ascension, like sky longitude, declination, like latitude. Exactly. Having those numbers lets you point right at it very accurately. So, okay, we found the spot. What about equipment? You hinted it's not for beginners. Yeah, that's putting it mildly. This is not an entry-level scope target. So my little four-inch. Probably not going to show you much, honestly, if you're using anything under, say, eight inches aperture. You'll likely only glimpse a very faint, maybe ghostly glow. So for scopes near that eight-inch mark, maybe you only see bright patches without a filter. So the filter becomes absolutely essential then, especially if there's any light pollution or haze. Precisely. And the filter choice matters, too. 
An OIIII filter is designed to pass light from doubly ionized oxygen. That's a key emission from nebulae like the crescent, so it really highlights the structure, those faint arcs and filaments. Okay. A UHC filter is broader. It blocks a lot of common light pollution, but still lets through important nebula lines like OIIII and hydrogen beta. So it gives really high overall contrast, which can be great under, say, suburban skies. Sometimes it's worth trying both if you have them. Okay, so we're geared up, filter in place, pointed correctly. Now, actually seeing it, that involves some technique, right? It's not just staring straight ahead. Oh, absolutely. It's an art. First tip, always start with low power. Maybe around 80x. That gives you a wide field, makes it easy to sweep the area, confirm you've actually found the nebula, get your bearings first. Don't jump straight to high power. Good advice. Find it, confirm it, then what? Crank up the magnification. Yes, once you've definitely located it, then increase the power. Try pushing it to 150x, maybe 200x, depending on your scope and the seeing conditions. The higher magnification makes the faint details larger, easier to pick out. You start seeing the curve, maybe some texture. And I know for faint objects like this, people always talk about patience and averted vision. Can you explain that a bit? Why is looking away from it helpful? Right. Averted vision is absolutely key for faint deep sky stuff. It sounds counterintuitive, but you don't look directly at the nebula in the eyepiece. You look slightly off to the side, maybe 10 or 20 degrees. You're using the rod cells in your peripheral vision. The more sensitive ones. Exactly. They're much better at detecting faint light in the dark than the cone cells in the center of your vision. So the nebula often seems to kind of shimmer or flash into view when you use averted vision, especially as your eyes get fully dark adapted. It's like it only appears when you're not looking right at it. That takes practice, I bet. It does. And patience. Don't expect to see everything instantly. Give your eyes time. And something I really recommend is trying to sketch what you see. Sketching. At the eyepiece. Yeah. Even a rough sketch. It forces you to really look, to notice the subtle shapes, the faint extensions. I find it incredibly rewarding. Many observers report just immense joy tracing those faint arcs. It really connects you to the observation. That's a great idea. Okay, let's switch gears for a second. What about astrophotography? Yeah. Is the crescent a good target for imagers? Oh, absolutely. It's an excellent target, especially for narrowband imaging. It responds beautifully to those filters we mentioned, OIIII and also H-alpha. H-alpha captures hydrogen light, really brings out the bright filaments and overall structure. Mm. Then the OIIII adds that depth, revealing the fainter oxygen regions, giving you that fantastic detail and color contrast when you combine them. And exposure times. We're talking long exposures, I assume. Definitely. To really dig deep into the faint structure, you're looking at exposures in the range of, say, 600 to 1,200 seconds. That's 10 to 20 minutes per filter. Wow. Okay. And you need plenty of those, plus good calibration frames your darks, flats, bias to get a clean signal and reveal all those fine filaments and shell details. A common challenge, though, is balancing the exposure. The inner part of the crescent is quite bright compared to the really faint outer arcs. Ah, uh, dynamic range issues. Exactly. Yeah. You want to capture the faint stuff without totally blowing out the core. So that might mean combining different exposure lengths or using HDR techniques in processing. Makes sense. And what about the telescope setup? Any particular focal length that works well for framing it? Yeah, wide field setups tend to work really well. Something in the focal length range, about 800 to 1200 millimeters, thinking in terms of a full frame camera equivalent. Okay, 800 to 1200 millimeter full frame equivalent. Right. That usually gives you a nice field of view to capture the whole nebula, maybe even some surrounding star fields without it being too small in the frame or cropping off the faint extensions. So after exploring its... Uh cosmic origins and how to actually see or capture it. Mm -hmm. What does this all mean for us? What's the real payoff here? Well, NGC 6888, it really is that perfect blend. It's visually rewarding, potentially, but it's also a genuine observational challenge. It makes you work for it. It does. And that fleeting glimpse or that hard won photo of those faint arcs, it's not just about seeing light. It's kind of profound. It's this powerful reminder that the universe doesn't always just hand us its beauty on a plate. You know. Right. You have to seek it out. It teaches us patience. It refines how we observe, how we perceive faint things. And it deepens our appreciation for what we can uncover when we really focus and dedicate ourselves. That's a fantastic thought to leave people with. The idea that every challenge you overcome kind of levels up your observing skills. Exactly. Yeah. Opens up more of the universe to you. We absolutely encourage you take this knowledge Get out under the stars with your telescope and really test your skills on the crescent. Give it a go. Let us know how you get on. Yeah. 
And hey, if you enjoyed this episode of Skyscope and you're hungry for more challenging, beautiful, and off the beaten path objects in the night sky, which we hope you are, make sure to subscribe to our channel. By subscribing, you won't miss a single target, tip, or opportunity to take your observing to the next level. Keeps you in the loop. Thanks for listening. And until next time, clear skies and steady seeing. Clear skies. Skyscope. Challenging targets, real observing. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for weekly podcasts and more.